welcome in person, online. So excited to be with you. My name is John. I serve as pastor here at the Springs. If you're looking for some seats there in the back, there's a whole section that nobody ever really sees or notices right down here at the front. If you're a member at the Springs, one of the things we're having right now is some space things and finding seats. We're trying to stack more to the back. If you're a member at the Springs, would you just fight to shift this way Sunday mornings to create just an easier space for folks there? If you're not a member, though, you sit wherever you want. We're glad you're here. We'll give way to a little bit of consumerism. Just kidding. One of the things I love doing, honestly, one of the things I love doing is hearing people's stories. I love hearing backgrounds, testimonies, if you're in like a Christian space, why you are the way you are, family dynamics, whole situation, life, job, circumstances. Oftentimes, especially, what trends on a spiritual journey for you. Because whether you believe in Jesus Christ or you're wrestling with it or you deny him, here's what's true. I imagine, especially if you're here, you consider yourself on some type of faith journey. It's always interesting to learn where those begin. What informed you? Why you are the way you are. If you've been with us for the past few months, and here's what you know. We are right now working our way through the book of Matthew. It is this documentary, it is a biography of the life of Jesus Christ, written through the lens of one of his disciples, Matthew. If you know about Matthew, here's what becomes of him. He becomes an apostle, a huge big-time church leader. He sets up and he is an overseer and an elder of the first church of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. He will go on to lead people. He will go on to tell others about Jesus. He will go on to be a missionary down into Africa. And his life, according to church tradition, will end in Ethiopia. See, he lived, he told people about Jesus, anyone and everyone. Like, if you would listen, he would tell you. And he went to Ethiopia. And you know how he died? According to tradition, he was impaled by stakes to the ground. And then beheaded. I know, it's an uplifting tone. Why? Because he couldn't stop telling people what Jesus had done for him. Here's what I love about it. Today we're going to get to see a little bit of his background. Today we're going to get to understand just a little bit of, of a glimpse of his, for lack of a better word, origin story. Right? Or we can come and see origin stories in movies and comics and whatever it might be. We're all about going in the past to understand something in the present. And today, we get a glimpse into the moment when Jesus Christ called Matthew to be a disciple. He said, hey, Matthew, come. Follow me. Here's why I think this matters. Not only do I think this text, it's reminded me, and I think it's going to remind you, of the sincere depth of God's grace love and commitment towards you, whether or not you want him or not. I think that's true. But the second thing, especially if you're like a Christian here, right? Or you, or you grew up in church, I think today is supposed to help you as it's helped me deconstruct a lot of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, especially in a place like New Braunfels or Texas or the South, where it is so easy to just culturally follow Jesus. Where perhaps you're like me, where for my life, decade and a half, I would have said I was a Christian, and then I actually had a relationship with Jesus, and it helps discern the difference between what's really following and what might be well-intended confusion of following. That's why I think this matters so much. So if you have a Bible, turn to me. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 9 through 13, just a short, sweet section. Where in this, we're going to talk about the call of a disciple. What does it mean that Jesus comes into an entire world? He bids them to be his disciple. What does that term really mean? I love the way a pastor describes that. He, he says that discipleship to Jesus, you could say it like this. It's like apprenticeship. Like, we all understand the premise of an apprentice. It's someone who, wanting to learn a trade, comes and imitates, comes and follows a master, someone who knows what they're doing. What does it look like to be an apprentice of Jesus? To where in your life, here's the reason you want this, because you've seen it to be true already. The areas of your life where you become more like him. Not only is there a sense of divine blessing in that, 
but it's just a better life every time. So to see this call of a disciple today, we're going to talk about it in two ways. What Jesus asks, who Jesus invites. If you know the context of where we are in Matthew 9, here's what you would have heard if you were with us last week. Jesus went and he's demonstrating his authority. He had these amazing miracles, like lights out, historic, learn them from Sunday school all the way to today, miracle moments where he comes and he literally brings calm to a storm where his followers, his disciples in that moment think they're going to die and he calms waves. He rebukes waves. Then he shows up and literally delivers two men possessed of demons, just calls them out out. These demons had a name. Their name was Legion. And then he comes, and there is literally a broken man paralyzed on a mat. He can't even get to Jesus, but he's desperate for hope, desperate for help. And four friends, just with a little bit of faith, take a corner of the mat, they bring him to Jesus, and Jesus says, hey man, you, you, your sins are forgiven. Jesus is showing his amazing authority. That's the context. And then right here, we're going to see an example of what he asks, who he invites, and what really is a right response to the authority of Jesus. I'm going to read the full section, 9 through 13, but then we're going to jump into it. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. 13. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth and said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. As Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. There is so much in here, and I sincerely cannot wait to unpack it. But here's what I'll start with. This is Jesus calling his disciple Matthew. Matthew is going to become a significant, big deal leader in the ministry and the mission of advancing the kingdom of God. And this is his beginning. The first thing that we really see through this passage, the first idea that really comes out is what does Jesus ask of a disciple? Like if you're here and you believe in him or you're here and you're wrestling with the idea of is he real, is he true, what would he ask of me? We have this broken tendency and I, I don't exactly know why. I think it's because we're all just fallen, broken people. We have this tendency to immediately jump to like, okay, well, what is Jesus asking of me? All right. Pretty much every bad and destructive, sinful habit I've got in my life, I just need to stop it. We'll see if that's where he starts. We'll see if he starts with bad behavior, or we'll see if he starts with a different set of beliefs. We'll see if he starts with your relationships with other people and the destructive things that you in your life you know are bringing harm and pain. You'll see if he starts there, or will he start with just your and my relationship with him? Here's how he begins. As Jesus passed on from there, He saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and he followed him. This is the calling of a disciple. The first thing you have to see is what does Jesus ask of Matthew? It's plain. He says it. Follow me. Follow me. Now, now some of you, or or perhaps many of you, you grew up in church and you heard this, and I think this at times can almost be one of those talks like, oh, yeah, Matthew, no, no, I got it, heard it, checked the box, taught the thing, yes, just follow Jesus, all of that. I really think this is one where you and I need to slow down. What would this moment have been? Who would have been coming? Who did Jesus just heal? A paralyzed man on a mat. Let's say you're Jews in first century. You see that? That's miraculous. They just saw this, the Jews. He's starting to gather a crowd. The disciples, they're literally coming out of, hey, Jesus, you freaked us out. You took us into a storm. You healed a man possessed by a demon. 
terrifying, by the way. And then you came, you, par- you healed a paralyzed man. All right, that's cool. We want to do that. That's awesome. How could we do that too? Could you show us later? What's the deal with that? And then he shows up, and here he comes, and he finds Matthew sitting at a tax booth. What was true of Matthew? Matthew was a tax collector. He was a Jewish tax collector. To say it differently, he was literally a betrayer of his people. Anyone ever heard of Benedict Arnold? Okay, some of y'all paid attention in U.S. history, right? Revolutionary War, an American traitor, forever known as a traitor to his people. That's Matthew. Like Matthew is literally there. His occupation is robbing his brothers and his sisters in the Jewish faith. He was seen as unclean, as despicable, untouchable. Like I'm talking about, he's not allowed to go to synagogue. His word was so distrusted, he couldn't be listened to in a Jewish court. He was so unclean to the crowd, to the disciples, to what they would have thought Jesus would have felt. Jesus should have come and just started rebuking him. And he says, no, 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 come and hang out. He was not allowed to be touched. He was morally unclean, spiritually unclean. This was a man shrouded in isolation. He could pay for dinner. He could pay for lunch. He could could take whatever a first century Jewish version of a vacation would have been. And he was desperately alone. You ever heard of, in India, there's a broken class of people, and arguably you could find this class of people in every society. It would just look different. There's an outcast or deemed as a sense of the untouchables. He was the untouchable. And what does Jesus say? I see you. I came for you. Follow me. I think we hear follow me, and again, we just kind of like wash over that simply. But what are some things that from this passage we can pull out and know is just true? Because this is the thing. You and me, man, we have this real big tendency to overdo, overcomplicate what it means to follow Jesus. But when you get to its core, what, what is he talking about? When he says to Matthew, hey, man, you just come and you follow me. What does that mean? Right from the beginning, Jesus is saying, hey, man, I know exactly who you are. I know exactly how when you run with me, they're going to start talking about it. It shows up in the verses. I know how when I call you, every one of my disciples are going to be like, man, I don't know if you're you're really doing the right thing here. Hey, I was kind of trending with you. Like we were tracking with like healing a paralyzed man. And hey, even the demon thing, I can see the demon thing now. I get it. Okay, I got it. But this guy, your Bible describes there were sinners Then there were tax collectors. The sinners did not want to be associated with the tax collectors. Jesus is coming and he's saying to you, whatever your sin is, whatever your thing that you won't tell people, that you won't confess, and you think even as a Christian, confession is a weird thing for other folks. Jesus is coming and he's saying, I know the absolute worst of you. Let's hang out. Just get to know me. Follow me, man. Just come, just come follow me. I will take you as you are. How many folks here today, even knowing Jesus Christ, you desperately live a life of religiosity, not relationship, where you are just trying to clean yourself up. He would look at you and he would say, stop. Follow me. Stop trying to fix you. Get to know me. Follow me. Do you see the difference of what it means to be a disciple? What what it means to be called. Another thing I think is true is it shows the reality of a disciple. It's not pick yourself up by your bootstraps. There's this true sense also, hey, Matthew, when you follow me, it is deeply personal. It's deeply personal. But right out of the gate, I'm going to fuse to let you keep it private. Hey, Matthew, follow me. Hey, man, I want you to go tell your friends I'm now with you. I want you to go tell your friends. Like the Pharisees, they don't want to have dinner with me. 
but you and your friends, the untouchables, y'all, the desperate for a sense of community. And you know, these are the type of people, and maybe this is you, and it's great. I, I have the privilege of hanging out with folks. When folks have been sitting in a long-term sense of isolation, no community, no connection, when they get around someone that will listen, that will talk, they just emotionally vomit. And you just sit back, and you love, and you listen. That's what Jesus did at a dinner. He sat with the despicables, the broken, the outcasts. And here's the deal, y'all. You are the outcast. I am the outcast. You see what it means to follow? There is a sense of he will take you as you are. There is a sense of it's personal. But this is never private. If you have met the Savior of the world, that when other people look past you, he looks straight at you, and he says, follow mine, son, daughter. You don't keep that to yourself. You tell people. Why? Because you've lived a life where you have sat insecure about wondering if other people want to be around you. If other people want to be with you, if you are cool enough to go with this crowd, if you are cool enough to get married, or even in married, if you're cool enough to have those friends or these friends, or will you ever actually be on the in crowd at any moment in your life? You are always on the in crowd with Christ. You know, one of the ways Jesus is going to let Matthew define their relationship, he's going to say, hey, you can call me friend. You can call me brother. What? Does he ask? Does he ask that you come and you have it all together? Or does he ask that you simply follow? Follow. I think even as I say that, that, that perhaps is like this like Holy Spirit-driven sense of enlightenment and reminder and hope. But here's the thing, y'all. Even though you don't have to come and like pick yourself up or clean yourself off or put on your nice version of church clothes, even though we, we dress down here, so that illustration doesn't really connect here at Springs, right? Whatever that is for you, even you don't have to do that. Do you know what is true, though, of following? You actually have to follow. How many folks can show up Sunday mornings, check boxes, and attend and be a part of a gathering and show, talk Christian, act Christian, and then we just play this like Christian version of a child patty cake game where we are going through the motions, and Jesus is saying, no, 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 man, I don't want the motions. The Pharisees, they have a monopoly on the motions. I want you. Just get to know me. Follow. Disciples actually follow doesn't mean they have it all together. But there is a real desperate sense of my Savior, my Messiah, my brother, my friend. I might get to know him. Because as we get to know him, what happens? We become like him. This is the call of a disciple. Let's keep reading this passage and see Jesus is just about to go. Maybe not for you, but for me. Verse 10 through 13. And Jesus reclined at table in the house. I love that. Jesus is literally, Matthew's going to throw a party and Jesus is chilling. He reclined at table in the house. Behold. This word behold, if you don't remember from last week, it shows up anytime Jesus does amazing things. It happened right before Jesus calms a storm. It happened right before Jesus delivers men from demons. And it happens before Jesus healed a paralyzed man. Why? It's when Jesus does what other people doesn't do. He introduces supernatural grace, redemption, and love. What follows this word behold? Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Not just a couple. It's like Matthew had put out this e uh, APB or whatever that acronym is and basically said, hey, all the other untouchables, the only other people that I can talk to Someone will talk to us. Come. Dinner's on me. I, I got it. I'll host. You just hang out. And they all come. Would have been the city, Capernaum. The news would have gotten out. It would have been scandalous. Behold. And when the Pharisees saw this, insert stage left, antagonists. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, I love that. 
they don't even come and ask Jesus. They ask the disciples. The disciples are probably like, man, I get it. I don't know why we're here. They said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Here's what they're saying. If he claims that he comes and he brings cleansing, holiness, hope, redemption, why does he hang out with the unclean, the hopeless, the broken, the looked past? But when he heard it, he said, and this is where Jesus, he, he's talking to these Pharisees. He's answering their question, right? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well, they have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Like, I, I don't go to the doctor and just spend money on a copay when I'm feeling great, right? This was literally a first century, like, Jewish almost wisdom saying. It would have just been like a linguistic thing people said all the time. It's the idea of, hey, sick people don't go get help. Or sick people go get help, excuse me. Yeah, a bunch of y'all were looking at me like, wait a minute, hold on. I feel like that's the Pharisee. Yes, yes, well done. Critical thinking, I love it. And Jesus is saying, I've, I've come for the sick. And then he has another scandalous line. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Here's the thing. Jesus is looking at these Pharisees and he's saying, hey, go and learn what this means. This is literally like saying, hey, you are a Bible seminary professor with PhDs in Bible. Hey, I need you to go learn what your Bible teaches. It would be like you saying to the PhD professor in Bible, hey, hey, I need you to go study what that Bible teaches. There would have been this like self-righteous, I imagine, sense of like, who are you to say to me? And what is Jesus doing? He's saying, I'm the creator of the universe and I'm saying to you, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. This is where a lot of times when we're reading, we kind of just skim past that passage. That's where so many times when you read, guys, I'm telling you, Holy Spirit wants to meet with you through the reading of his word, and you got to like lean in. You have to feast on the truth of God. Here's what's true about this verse. It is a reference to Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. Jesus, through a Jewish author, Matthew, to a Jewish author, audience, the disciples, and really the audience Matthew is writing to. He is appealing to the message of an Old Testament prophet of Hosea, where he's saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. What he's saying is, man, I want real love, not religiosity and jumping through hoops, walking Christian, acting Christian, talking Christian, but not knowing Christ. And he pulls out Hosea. Now, I know Many of you here, you are well-versed in the minor prophet Hosea. That if we were to come and look at your Bible, and most of y'all probably don't even have like a paper Bible, but it would be well-worn pages because it's so well-studied. For some of you, perhaps you know the story of Hosea through a Christian classic, Redeeming Love. Anybody here read Redeeming Love? Okay, all right, we have some honest people. All right, I respect it. Uh, My wife and I, Taylor, when we started dating, been a follower of Jesus about nine months. It was this whole thing. I was like, Christian dating, totally out of redeem. The way I did in the past, what's a great date? So you're constantly thinking up great ideas. Okay, how do I go? I took her to Barnes and Noble, right? It's a store where they sell books in print. They have those in urban environments. There's usually like one per city. So you got to go there now because they're going to be closed soon. It's basically the new version of what like the uh, Xerox was. That said, I took her there and I looked at her, right? And I had a I had a different job, and I was like, all right, sweetie, you get any book you want, I'll buy. Whatever book you get me, I will read. And whatever book I get you, you have to read that book. And I'm sitting there, new to Christ. I want to lead well. Never even known what Christian leadership really looked like. And I'm like, okay, I got to get a book that really impacted me. She goes, and she gets me redeeming love. Francine Rivers. I didn't know Hosea. I did not know anything about God chopping wood, shirtless, 
dripping in sweat. <laughs> See, if you're laughing at that, you've read that book. It's, it's super weird. Whatever, though, right? But it's the story of Hosea. And then me, I wanted to get her something. I got her the first book in the series of Harry Potter. <laughs> you should pray for me. So grateful I'm here to teach you all the Bible. I read Redeeming Love, right? F- fictionalized Bible inspiration. I- I'm not throwing shade at Redeeming Love. Here- here's what I'm saying, though. Jesus is one verse of I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And closes it all. Far more than that book. The truth of redeeming love. To understand what Jesus is doing with Matthew. To understand what Jesus is doing with the sinners sitting with tax collectors at tables. To understand what Jesus is doing to the Pharisees. To understand what Jesus is doing with you and he's doing with me. You must understand Hosea. We're going to step out of Matthew, and I'm going to summarize the book of Hosea for you. The book of Hosea, he's, he's a minor prophet. He lived approximately 750 years before Jesus was born. At that time, the people of Israel, God's people, they'd been split into two countries. There'd been civil war. There was Israel in the north, Judah in the south, but they were dysfunctional, disobedient, and turning their hearts from God. God was sending them prophets, people to say, come back, come home, follow God, trust Yahweh, his way, not yours. He kept sending and sending and sending and sending, and they were declining and declining and declining and declining. God would bring judgment. To the northern tribe of Israel. Before he would bring that judgment, he would send them Hosea. Hosea is the last prophet to speak to the northern tribe. If you know Jeremiah, he does the same thing, much with Judah. Hosea goes, and his job is to tell them God's love and God's call to follow. What's interesting, though, is if you know Hosea, then you know he arguably, and I'd argue it respectfully, had one of the cruelest callings, hardest convictions given by God. God came to Hosea, and he literally speaks to him. This is Hosea chapter 1. We're going to summarize 1 through 3. And he literally comes and says, Hosea, I'm going to use you to show the people my love for them. Your life is going to be a practical symbol of my love for Israel. And I love Israel, but Israel runs from me, abandons me, and they are spiritually adulterous. Hey, Hosea, I'm asking you to go, and I'm asking you to marry a prostitute. I want you to go and marry a prostitute, Hosea. Why? Because as she breaks your heart, it will show Israel the reality of how they break my heart. Though she is meant to be committed and promised unto you, and it crushes you. Because you are committed. You are covenant in love with her. I want to use your heartbreak to show the people how my heart breaks. How I'm calling them back. Hosea is going to be a symbol, an example of God's love for Israel. Hosea's wife, her name was Gomer. Not the coolest name, right? (laughs) Whatever, though. If you've named your kid Gomer, I was going to apologize. But honestly, you should apologize to them, right? But we'll keep going, okay? Right? Gomer's the wife. Gomer is meant to represent Israel. God comes to Hosea, and he says, marry a woman language he uses is of whoredom. Go and have children of whoredom. See, we read our Bible and we we just glimpse past that or we think it's fable or legend. No, I'm telling you, there was a literal man named Hosea. He was a prophet of God. He was well known amongst the people as a truth teller, as a seer, as one that was saying before Gomer even showed up, no, turn Follow God, repent of your sin, it's the better way. He would have been like a northern Israelite celebrity. He was well known, and God comes to him in private, and he says, you marry a prostitute. And this was not a prostitute that just by industry or perhaps by force was compelled into it. You see in chapter 2, she wanted it. She chased lovers. You And me, we chase the brokenness. We want the brokenness. We yearn 
for the dysfunction, even though we would never call it so. He says, marry her. Have kids with her. The story goes on. They have three kids. Their names, whew, tough names, right? They have three kids. The first child, biologically, is ascribed to Hosea. The next two are not. Scholars seem, they seem to think, Hosea at that moment, not only in the marriage, but Gomer is repeatedly cheating on him, going away, and then he is raising other men's children. By the way, marriage, the institution, has always meant to be a picture of unconditional love. Marriage, biblically, is a unique relationship where you are giving permission to a spouse to break your heart. And in the brokenness, look at them and say, great. Why? That's how God loves you. But back to the story. They have three kids. That second two, not ascribed biologically to him. Then there's a moment where Gomer, you see this and we're going into chapter two, she's going to abandon the family. She leaves them. Why? She wants to go prostitute herself. She's choosing it. She even becomes a well-known woman of prominence in this industry. She's doing well. She's making money. She's getting taken care of. She's literally chasing validation through it the same way you chase validation through your career through what other people think of you, through your status, through your education, through, oh, if I can only be married or if only I could have kids. She chased it. And there's almost this tone of Hosea like, okay, man, hey, she abandoned, I'll raise the kids. I got this. It, it was probably easier without her. You come to chapter three. God comes to Hosea in chapter three. And he says something that must have just been heartbreaking. It's this language of, hey, go again. Love her again. Renew your vows. Imagine that. Your spouse leaves you. You would have been the public laughing stock of Israel. Like, you have to imagine, Hosea, he was still a prophet, a teacher of God. He's walking around. People would have come up to him, and they would have almost had this sense of, like, wait, wait, aren't, aren't, aren't you Hosea? Yeah. I'm, I'm Hosea. Perhaps he had his kids with them. Like, one of their kids was being disobedient because he had to look after the other two. He wasn't able to fully cover the third. Someone comes up, oh, are, are these, these your kids? Yeah. They're my kids. I wonder if when he said my, he paused. He was a real man. I wonder if anyone ever looked at him because Israel did not want God. They were rebelling against God. They were foolish against God. I wonder if anyone looked at him. I, I probably would have and said something like, oh, you're the guy telling me the way I'm supposed to go. How if I follow God, that's the right way for me to go. Is that right? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. And you can't even keep your wife? Hey, let me ask you. Do you, do you know where your wife is right now? I don't know where she is. So you, you're telling me, the man of God, the prophet, the teacher, can't find his wife. She, she left him. But God is good. God is faithful. That would have been his moment. And then God comes to him and he says, hey, Hosea, go again. Renew your vows. Marry her. Go find her. I love the way a pastor, he described it like this. That prophet in that moment, he had to go and search her out. He literally, though, where had she been? Prostitute. She was on that side of town, that part of the city, that literally, as a prophet and a teacher, he'd spent his entire life trying to avoid that side of town. And he had to go find her. How long did that take? I have no idea. What did that look like? I have no idea, but I can guess. He would have had to walk. He probably would have known because she'd become a woman of prominence. But in chapter 2, you see she has this downfall. It's symbolic of Israel's judgment, their future exile and destruction by the Assyrians. She had this downfall where she'd gone from prominence to now she was a common sex slave. He would have gone to find her. Do you think he asked folks, hey, 
Have you seen my wife? Her name, her name is Gomer. Oh, Gomer's your wife? Aren't, aren't you? Yeah, it's my wife. Hey, I, 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 was, I wasn't with her, but you're going to find her that way. Good luck. He walks. He comes and he finds her. This is verse 2. He's going to have to purchase her. He's going to redeem her. He's going to have to buy back what was already his. In order to buy her, scholars, they talk about how what she's likely at is literally an auction. She is being auctioned as a sex slave. He would walk into that moment. What is that moment like? You've got to remember, if you don't understand Hosea, you're not going to understand Matthew. You're not going to understand the sinners at the table. You're not going to understand Jesus' call to the Pharisees. You're not going to understand Jesus' call to you and to me. He walks in. She's at an auction. I imagine, right? Auctions have been tragically horrific for centuries. She's up on a platform. He comes in, and there's this heart of, that's my wife. A man owned her. He will have to purchase her for silver and bushels of grain. I wonder if someone said back to him, and we don't know, guys. This is biblical creativity. It's imagination. But he's literally there. There's literally an auction. He's literally got a purchaser. I wonder if has he said, wait, no, I don't need to buy her. She's my wife. No, no, you need to buy her. She's my property. Sex slave auction, is she clothed? I don't think so. There's a demonstration of what's available. Are there other men there looking? Do they bid against Hosea for her just to mess with the prophet? And Hosea looks at a woman that is already his wife and says, I'll buy her. She's mine. Verse 3, comes in, and Hosea is going to use this language. Hey, I'm going to take you away. Who you were, it's not going to be what you do. Who you were, it's not going to be who you are. You are committing to me. I am committing to you. I bet his heart broke at the end because I bet he was terrified. Anyone here have trust issues because people have hurt you in the past, and therefore you have hard times trusting now? Hosea was an actual man. What does Hosea do with her? He renews his vows. Here's the thing. Hosea is this book. The first three chapters are about his marriage. Chapters 4 through 14, they are about his message to the people, how the marriage was symbolic of it. It is the sense of, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You quit your religiosity in turning to adulterous, broken forms of hope and validation. You won't find love there. Come home. And right there, Jesus is saying, why have I come for Matthew? Why have I come for the sinners? Why have I come for the Pharisees? Why have I come for the disciples? Because I came for Gomer. You, in your sin, your dysfunction, your slavery, your captivity, I bought you back. You are mine. I gave breath to your lungs. I formed you in your mother's womb. I know the hairs on your head. And you wander, you leave, you go. I do it too. We are broken. And he comes back and he says, why am I coming for Matthew? Because I came for Gomer. You are Gomer. Your sin, it may not be prostitution, or it may be. It may be your offensive self-righteousness, your refusal to trust other people, your sense that it doesn't really matter how you follow Jesus because you are saved, you are fine, and you offend him with your understanding of cheap grace. It may be your addiction to porn that you are terrified to tell anybody and everybody. It may be the fact that you're here in the relationship and there's no purity, that you behind closed doors, you are offensive, you are hurtful, you are cruel in your marriage. Repent! Whatever it is, 
you and I were on the auction block. He bought us back. The call of a disciple. What does he ask? Follow. You don't have to have it all together. Did Gomer have it all together after she got off that? I don't think so. You and I must realize who is invited to this table. Who reclines with Jesus while he sits with sinners. By God's grace and God's grace alone. You. Me. It does not matter who you are. It does not matter what you've done. Our society loves to create outcasts and marginalized. We love to come and pick on some sins and not the others. Here's the truth. Sin is real. Jesus says deal with it. He says repent of it. Do not tolerate it. But here's the thing. He will take you as you are. Some of us here, we are followers of Jesus. But we've forgotten this truth. He'll take you as you are. You think that in order to follow, you have to come cleaning yourself up, getting your act together. You having to almost be like this sense of Gomer where she went back and had you pay penance with Hosea. No, 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 no. Her sin is before God and before him. And there's forgiveness. This is the call of a disciple. It's crazy to think how much he actually loves you. It's crazy to think how much he loves you. Like that moment he sees Matthew. Matthew's just Gomer. You are the next Gomer. You remember the moment where, however, audibly in your soul through other people in a sermon reading his word, where his spirit tapped on your soul and said, follow. You didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. We're talking about the call of a disciple. A foundational understanding, like he, he really does love you. He totally wants to deal with sin. He totally deals with it. But you must start with an understanding of who you are before him. You had nothing to offer, and he so desperately loves you. He bought you back. And from there, follow. So what are we supposed to do? Like if you're here, like what, what, what should you do in, in light of this? If you remember the context, Jesus has shown his authority. And then here he's showing what is a right response. Like let's say you're here and you're wrestling with faith. You've wrestled with Jesus. I am telling you emphatically for the rest of your life, no one will ever love you like this. Unconditional, unbreaking, Seeing you in your dysfunction, knowing you and loving all of you, if you don't know him, take one step and believe. Believe. You know what he's going to do for Matthew? He's going to go and die on a cross for all of his sins, all of Gomer's sins, all of my sins, and all of yours. Follow him. Now, let's say you're here and you consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, like you have the indwelling power of God's spirit, God himself within you. Take one step and follow. What is one area of your life, and this is not picking yourself up by your bootstraps, this is basically getting to know the greatest love of your life and just get to know him. For some of you, what that'll look like is you think you can go through this Christian journey by yourself. No, no, no. Get connected to a community. If not here, connect somewhere. Walk with other Christians. For some of you, you come and you have a caricature of Jesus. You think you know him, but is this unbiblical, culturally informed version of Jesus. Read his word and just get to know him. Take one step. I assure you, if you have the Holy Spirit and you pray, God, what is one step you'd have me take? He will tell you. What's the second thing? Tell one person. One of the things that's amazing about the book of Matthew that you may not know, this story, the calling of a disciple, it's referenced in also Luke and Mark. But in Luke and Mark, they call Matthew by a different name. See, Matthew, he's going to get a different name. They call him by Levi. Why do they call him by Levi? Why does Matthew call himself by Matthew? 
scholars think that they call him by Levi to almost give honor and respect to the fact of who he was in that town in Capernaum, the reputation he would have had as a tax collector and the shame that would have been on him. Why does Matthew use his own name as he writes himself into this story? Because right there he's showing, as he literally documents the narrative and the life and the gospel of Jesus Christ, he's literally showing, here's what he saved me from. Here's my dysfunction. Here's my wounds. Here's how I was a thief. I was a betrayer. I wasn't even considered to be around the sinners. And he came for me. He loves me. He will write a book about Jesus. He will go and lead a church on behalf of Jesus. He will be a missionary for Jesus. What could we do? Tell one person. You don't have to have all the words. Even if it's as simple as, no, 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 here's what I'm telling you. I don't even fully understand it, but here's what what you know, and I know I sound like a total weirdo. He actually loves you a ton. I'd love for you to consider coming. You can invite him here. You can invite him to your dinner table. Tell one person. Y'all, this is the call of a disciple. I'll close with this. Um, Heaven, it's going to be amazing. It's not some environment or place or celestial plane where we just sit on clouds and with harps and sing about God to eternity like one never-ending loop of a Chris Tomlin concert. That, for many of us, is closer to hell. Shout out, Chris. I respect everything you did, okay? Heaven will be a place where you will see Christ face to face. You'll see him. There's cities, there's roads, there's houses, there's places where you will go. There's water, there's food, there's feasts, there's drink. There is no pain, there is no suffering, there's no dysfunction. There is a love and a respect and an understanding of Christ. The reality of this new heavens, new earth, he takes brokenness, he redeems it, he makes it new. And you know what else is true? You'll remember your life. You will remember how you stewarded your life. You will remember your loved ones. Here will be the thing. I think this will be true of Matthew. I cannot wait to meet Gomer. I cannot wait to share a meal with Gomer. To talk to her about what was that like? Where was your heart before? What was that moment when Hosea comes and calls? How did that then make you after that, this sense when people would come up to you? Because Gomer had left. They would have noticed she was gone, right? If Brad and Angelina break up, everybody knows. If they get back together, everybody knows, right? They get back together, everybody knows. Do you think folks came up to her? I want to ask at like the market or wherever she was out, And they said, oh, you're back. Huh. I wonder how long you'll stay this time. Oh, you're back. We'll see how it goes. How do you think she responded? I I can't wait to ask. I, I, I think, because this is what will happen with Israel, and she's a picture of Israel, a remnant will come back. I think she looked at me and said, no, man, I totally get it. Here was my sin. Here was my dysfunction. No, no, no. God sent Hosea. Bless that man. But I got to tell you, bless my God. My God who loved me, forgave me, redeemed me, set me free, and I am saved by my faith in his promises. I'm set free. I'm not the whore. I'm the daughter. I'm not the slave. I'm a child, and I'm telling you, you got to believe this. He literally sent me to tell you. I think Gomer was an amazingly faithful disciple. And by God's grace and his grace alone, I'm going to ask her about it. But while we wait, that is how we are to live in love, all in. 
Let me pray. Jesus, I just thank you that your Bible, like you, you show us so much. I, I thank you that you even are so gracious to allow like biblically informed creativity to where we can think about what it will be like, what it was like. Lord, I thank you that you came from Matthew, that you went for Gomer, that you came for me. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. You are merciful from me, God. You desire mercy, not sacrifice. You don't want a religious show. You want a yielded soul. Do that here at the Springs. Do that in this city. Make us your people yielded to you, imperfect. Deal with our sin, but know as we deal with the sin, we are already forgiven. We want to follow you. We confess we so have a tendency to complicate that, to make it more than what you ever intended. And we confess that even though you simplify it, we just don't do it. Our ditch isn't following. It is apathy. It is spiritual laziness. It is indifference. It is being swamped, my heart being swamped by what other people in the culture say following you should look like. I just want to follow you. Make that the anthem of this body. We thank you for the gift of what you've done. It's in your name we pray. Amen.